Pro School. It's September 1st, 2016, and we're in the garden, and as you can see, it's very abundant, so uh, permaculture has been proven to be effective. Um, we have lots of bees in the garden today. It's a beautiful Colorado September day, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and one of the reasons why we plant flowers in a vegetable garden is because it helps pollinate the vegetables. And as you can see, there's lots of bees in this. And uh, that's good because the bees uh, have uh, some issues. They were disappearing for a long time. And, you know, the more bee beekeepers we have, the better. Beekeeping is a huge uh, part in permaculture and should be part of your farm design or landscape design. Even just one hive can improve your crop yield. Just amazing and it helps uh, teach you about the uh, feminine aspects of farming and uh, the queen and how she uh, manages um, all her worker bees and everything. And it's very fascinating, very uh, fun hobby to get into. So, but as you see, there's some uh, flowers for the vegetables. These are pumpkins and the pumpkins growing. And see, this helps the, the bees come, they're attracted to all of this. And uh, they help keep it really healthy. We have a little powdery mildew going on, but I always get that here. And I think if I add some sulfur to the soil, that would make it okay. If you don't use, uh, if you use overhead watering, you'll get powdery mildew sometimes because the droplets and it's really easy to, it stays in the soil. It's really hard to get rid of. But as you can see on the leaves here, see that? So I would rip off leaves like that with that, or you could use milk or baking soda. There's all sorts of old fashioned remedies for powdery mildew. It's a huge thing in the garden. It seems like it, um, it affects more of the viney plants, more of the succulent ones like squashes, cucumbers. I know it affects roses and um, many different plants. So you always want to have uh, something ready and prepared to fight diseases and pests and hopefully naturally and organically. So I can use milk, a diluted uh, mixture of milk and, and, and I can try to put that on. And there's also a lot of other organic recipes. So um, I'm not going to worry about it now because it's not taking over. But um, I'm going to show you the rest of the garden here. This is the three sisters that we showed you earlier in the season. Where we had the corn, the pumpkin, the squash, and the green beans all together. So here the corn is just starting. And the raccoons haven't found, me, found it yet. I know they're waiting, and I should have electric electric fence around here. Um, and if I get you know nailed, that's you know my responsibility. But they uh, they know when you're going to have corn, so you usually should double up on a, uh, like the electric fence um, if you have raccoons in your neighborhood, which I do because they got rid of the coyote here, and oh the population just doubled with. Uh, the raccoon so but this is a great example of the three sisters here we have your viney plants we have uh, the corn and we have the green beans see that what there's some green beans you see that they're already producing beans so you have three syllable crops to your farm stand and the nitrogen from the beans is going into the corn and helping to fertilize the corn. So that's looking good. And then this keeps the, the bugs off of the corn. And um, if you feel it, they, they have these little razor sharp pins. And it, the bugs hate them. But here we got a, we got a bunch of squash. There we got this uh, Hubbard squash. And then this one is like a spaghetti squash. And then here's some beans. I would pick it about that size or smaller. They're really good to cook with, grill. 
some salt and pepper, butter. But so I would get rid of these, the ones that have the powdery mildew and if you want to burn them or put them somewhere where they won't spread disease. Here's some beets. Oh wow, that's a big one. There we go. There's some beets. Uh, and they have sugar in them, so if you have livestock, you can feed your beets to your livestock. I think I'm going to feed these to the... Um, Oh, that's some big Swiss chard. That's like monster Swiss chard. Look at that. That's the biggest Swiss chard I've ever seen. Wow. Oh, this is kale. We have a sale on kale. <laughs> You're really good kale. They're pretty good. Um, here's some turnips. We got turnips. Here's some turnips. <sighs> ah! Oh, there's a snail, a uh, slug. To get rid of those, you put out some beer and they'll go and get drunk. Little tin, so they can sludge their way in there. Yeah, that's a huge turnip. You gotta go, bud. You're not supposed to be here. But yeah, that's, that's big. That's, that's monstrous. You could make a whole meal out of that or a soup. That's an old-fashioned vegetable. I used to eat a lot of it during the Depression, my dad said. He made us eat it, too. Like, it, the Depression was never really was over, food-wise. But it's a good one to grow. It's really easy. And then we have some carrots. Are they ready? Oh, Oh, that's pretty good. Some the carrots. The better your soil is, then they grow straighter. Because all the root crops, you know, they don't like rocks and stuff. So this is uh, the September garden, permaculture garden in September. It's overflowing with abundance. So um, we talked about the principles of abundance before in the beginning and now you can see that this does work and you know it's just it's amazing and I think it's more aesthetically pleasing this way for me at least because it's more like a you're surrounded by come out here and meditate or you know just sit and relax and it's not straight rows you just you know for me it was it saved labor because I didn't have to, you know, do it uh, that way so I could scatter the seed and just break them in like I did. And this is what came out. And, you know, every year it gets better and better and you grow different things. And sometimes you have successes and sometimes you have failures. And um, that's part of learning with gardening um, and farming. And, and that's the fun of it. You could get a frost out in Colorado anytime. You always got to know that, but with the hugoculture beds, um, I've been through frosts and they haven't been touched. And with traditional agriculture, it was all killed. So I had that experience one year and that was really amazing because these keep heated and they are a higher temperature and somehow that protects the uh, vegetables. So I had this whole garden was traditional agriculture at one time and then I had just one hugoculture bed. So when the frost came, what I found very interesting was that all the traditional ag was dead, frosted over, and then my huge culture bed, my first one, was thriving well into like October, November. And I, I planted it late, you know, mid-July, and I was just like, that's how I really, it was just my first experiment, I got hooked because 
I was like, I'm done with traditional agriculture. First of all, it hurts my body. And second of all, it doesn't work as well. And um, my food's much better. I mean, look at the colors of this. Kale, they're so vibrant and rich with vitamins and, and, and no pesticides, none whatsoever. So I get all the vitamins that my body needs because the soil is what's providing that. And you gotta remember that when you choose which way you're gonna farm or garden, you know, do you want to uh, be creative or destructive? And that's the choice you have to make. And, you know, it's a personal one. And, and I'm just here to remind you that there is life in soil. And um, when you respect nature, it brings you abundance like this. Now, I can't possibly eat all this food or have this many flowers, so what do you do? You can give away your abundance. When you're abundant, you overflow. And that's what you do. You do self-care first. We, just, we talked about earth care, people care, and fair share from the beginning when we were talking about permaculture ethics, and now you see it live because we have so much. And you can save the seeds and use them for next year, which is, ooh, that's a prickly. Um, and that's another subject for another day, but um, seed saving with heirloom seeds, most of these are heirloom vegetables, so there's no GMOs or anything. And um, that's nice, because then you can save the seed and have it again for uh, next year. And now we're gonna go back to the greenhouse and we're gonna talk about plant propagation because seed saving and plant propagation are, are ways that you can continually um, have seed and plants for the next year's garden and also get free plants, which is, for me, is the best thing in the world. A free plant, I'll take it. Every time you give me a free plant, I will take it. I will teach you how to create more of what you already have and what nature has. And um, we'll start out in the garden and then another time we'll go out on a field trip to take cuttings from just wild places. And I can teach you how to do that without messing up the environment. Today we're gonna to talk about plant propagation. We took some cuttings of some wild roses earlier and we took them in and now we're going to propagate those and uh, I'm going to show you how to do it. It's very simple. So first of all, here's the wild roses. I took the new growth from it. There was old growth and I cut the new growth because that's the, the, the freshest, the newest part and uh, the, the cells rejuvenate the best in my opinion. So what I do, and you need to use bleach, uh, you can use a bleach uh, mixture of one to 10, but I just have pure bleach here because you don't want to uh, spread diseases um, when you're propagating plants. So you really want to use, take sanitary measures. So anyway, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut right above the nodes, there's a, uh, uh, these nodes, if you can zoom in here, they're, we're going to cut, we're going to take a piece right above there, and I'm just going to cut slant it, I'm going to slant cut it, and then I have my rooting hormone, and you can get this at the Walmart or any uh, grower's supply, like nursery or um, the, you know, Target, any place like that. So um, there's, this is called rooting hormone, and you can also make your own out of um, willow trees. They have um, a natural rooting hormone. Um, so that's what the Indians did. So I'm gonna just dip it, and this helps speed the process up. And then you just uh, take a pen, and you make a hole, and you have a sterile uh, mixture of, uh, of peat moss and uh, you don't have any soil, so you don't have bacteria. You don't, you know, it's a very sterile seed starting mix. So then you just plop it in and then you just tap it around. And then you can just water it in. And 
And you gotta keep them moist. And you, you could get a dome to put over it or just in the greenhouse, just water them every day, check on them every day. Um, just make sure they, they're they moist and, until they take root. And then in about two weeks, you come back and you can see if they take root by just kind of giving them a gentle tug. So, uh, and you can use plugs or um, there's uh, all sorts of methods of uh, propagating plants, but also you, I would put this on my uh, rocket stove and that helps heat it up from the bottom up and so it will warm your plants and they'll start better and they'll um, start faster. So that's a natural way of doing it. But um, I'm going to show you how to do a, a different type of cutting. This one is of a shrub. And it, uh, I'm going to just take the leaves off. And I'm going to do the same thing I did with the rose. And give it a slant cut just above a node. Oh, that one. I think I'm going to take another one. Make it shorter because I see some disease, uh, some scabs here. I don't want to, I don't want that, so. And try to remove all the leaves as possible because it, it would uh, put more uh, energy into the growth of the roots. So you're trying to, you know, um, redirect the, the, root, the, the energy into the roots for right now. And you dip it in, and then the same thing you do, just put a hole in there. And you can use your pen. And then you just water it in. And voila, you're making more plants. I did these cuttings and they're doing really well. And they're just some roses around the area and then some vines. So it's, it's really simple. This is old growth, you can root that, but I'd rather do the new growth it's easier and faster and they taste better so you look you see where the old growth is and you look down and you'll see little babies around there and um so this one i'm gonna cut it it makes a great hedge thing so i cut this this is new growth compared to old growth Okay, so the node you want to cut, um, you want to make sure it's going pointed up. So that's the direction the plant is. So that would be where your roots would be coming from below that. And the, this goes up. So if you want to always make the top, you just cut straight across. If you're doing a bunch of cuttings. And then you cut above a node. I'm going to find a node here. There's the node. So right there. And then you dip. So you have your top is flat and then your dip is slanted or vice versa. Just so you know if you're doing numerous cuttings. I'm going to take off this leaf so that can grow uh, new leaves and not have to worry about putting energy into that. But instead into its new life as a rose. A baby rose just like its mama. It's just cloning basically plant cloning and each plant has different requirements but this is basic 101 and you know you can just experiment if you see something you like just take a clipping and put it in water and go about your way and you know don't take the whole plant just take a little clipping and 
you can, you know, that's how you can make a garden for nothing. Yeah, I've had these, I have the, a couple months now in the water. Now I got roots, this one already has roots. So, um, it's already gonna be its own plant. So, I'm gonna start it, I'm just gonna cut the top. And because there's roots, I'm gonna trim those. And this will be a little different because I just put it in there and put it a little deeper. And that was just for putting it in the water and forgetting about it for a while. Because I'll take plant cuttings and I'll forget about them. And then if I have them in water, you know, they'll, they'll usually come back. So, um, you, you want to water in right away. And in a human environment's best. Bottom heat's good. And then a d d disease free stock, you know, make sure there's no diseases in the plants you're taking cuttings from. Because you don't want to get cuttings and then it has powdery mildew and then you're bringing in powdery mildew into your greenhouse. But um, you want to keep everything really clean and all your uh, utensils really clean. So that's Plant Propagation 101. We're going to talk about making your own rooting hormone today on Guys Grow School out of willow. These are some willow trees we have on the farm. And uh, some of these have been cut down so they can regrow even stronger. But uh, the Native Americans used willow to use as a, a rooting stimulant to propagate plants. And there's auxins in the uh, actual plant in willow that um, they make rooting hormone out of. So if you just don't want to go get the rooting hormone, you can make it out of uh, some of the live uh, tissues here. And you would ground it up and, and then into a powder. And you cut it up and, 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 and then you would just ground it up and then just use it just like you would with a, a regular um, rooting hormone. So this is a natural way to propagate plants and uh, this is the old-fashioned way. Willows are really prolific. Um, they'll come back right away. These were cut down this summer and they're already coming back. So you could get the young ones because they'll have more cell cells developing and more what's called auxins. And so uh, you can grind them up and make a powder out of it. And uh, that's a free way to root your plants up in the mountains or anywhere where willow grows. Um, it's free for the taking. So I suggest trying to experiment with it. Okay, I'm also gonna demonstrate some uh, ways of preserving nature just by letting weeds grow so right here is the butterfly plant and I have a lot of it in, on the farm and a lot of people would consider that uh, a weed it's milkweed actually um, so the butterflies when they migrate they love to feed on this so here's uh, some Canadian thistle and um, the goats don't like it um, the llamas don't like it. The horse doesn't like it. I'm not too like keen on it, but it does have uh, potential benefits and it helps a lot of bees. And um, uh, there's a lot of activity on here. And then there's a whole bunch of activity over there on them. So we'll go over there and show you how much life force there is in a, in a grove of weeds. And um, you know, you don't want too many of them. You want to get them before they turn into uh, that because you don't want to be fighting with that with your garden but um, I would take them down before they propagate again but it's not a big deal if you have some it's actually good and you don't really need to worry about it um, these have beneficial properties to the ecosystem and uh, there's a reason why 
we have them and why they thrive. So you can leave them or let them be, but it depends on the size of your acreage and what you're going for. I just let it go. Not all of them, but enough. So. Oh, he loves the greens. No, you can't go out. Stop hogging them all, though. You're hogging them all. I have to separate them. They fight over them. Can you hold this gate so I can... Oh, you can't. Oh, I'm I can... I'll just tie it up. Oh, okay. You gotta do like basketball watch. Then you go like this. Woo. The other ones they won't let you. <laughs> They're loving the hay, huh? Yeah. Sierra! She's a pig. These guys are spoiled. He's pretty. This is some good hay. Yeah, he's nope. Alfalfa snips. Levi, be nice. Uh oh, spinning fight starting. See how big the geese got? Levi's my multi-purpose beast. He's my guard. He's my bodyguard. He's my friend. He's my uh, companion. He's my lawnmower. Um, I think 
think it's the longest relationship I've had for, yeah, a long time. <laughs> um, I feed him treats. Uh, he loves apples and, and, and then he poops it out and gives me llama poop and I make tea out of it and I make beautiful flowers and then I get to create with the vegetables and grow vegetables and it's the cycle, you know, keeps going round and round. And then I don't have to mow. And, and that's good. Sometimes he'll steal uh, some petunias when he gets, like, it's like a leprechaun thing, you know, like, mischievous. But he doesn't, he wants me to see him doing it. Because he's, he won't eat it. It's just when he's feeling bratty. But yeah, he hangs out with me in the back and explores and Yesterday it was so cute, he put his head on the thing and he just sat there with me and I was hanging out outside. And very protective. No, Levi! No! See, he's doing it. Levi, you don't even like 